With Bolivia's election just one month away, there's plenty to discuss. Joining me now is Telesur journalist here in Quito, Ali Vargas, who himself is from Bolivia and also British. Ali, just less than two weeks ago, we saw that Bolivia's right wing had burned down a campaign headquarters of the MAS and also attacked a free healthcare center and attacked supporters of President Evo Morales. What can you tell us about that? That's right. Just recently, a small group of protesters marched on the campaign headquarters of the movement towards socialism, which is Evo Morales' left-wing ruling party. Um, the group behind this attack was the Cruceñista Youth Union. It's, um, so I think if you when you see the images like this, it is, is tempting to think that this is an act of spontaneous um, protest or a protest that spilled into violence. In reality, this group is a highly organized group with a long history as a traditional fascist movement. They were behind the, um, the violence in 2008 and 2009 when Santa Cruz and other regions in the east, in the east of Bolivia sought to secede from um, the mainland of the country um, in a failed coup attempt. Um, and there was these groups that received millions in funding from the National Endowment for Democracy during that period, and it's those same groups that are behind this violence today. Um, but beyond the, the events of this week, I think it's interesting to see the patterns of violence in Bolivia. Um, violence like this happens normally when the opposition feels it is most defeated. So when the violence broke out in 2008 and 2009, was during one of the highs of Evo Morales' popularity after nationalising the gas, enacting land reform, and was about to bring forward a new constitution. Those right-wing groups made the calculation that they would not be able to win um, at the ballot box across the country, so they focused on demands of secession, and with tactics of bringing violence to the streets. And, and just as today, um, they will look at the electoral panorama, they'll see Evo Morales on course for a first round victory, his fourth election victory. They don't see any of the candidates being able to unite the opposition or unite the country. So they revert to the tactics of 2008, tactics of violence, of destabilization. So a number of reports have come out in alternative media outlets like Mint Press and The Grey Zone that talk about the National Endowment for Democracy pouring in large sums of money to groups in Nicaragua. And these, of course, are groups that are supposed to be student and youth groups. So you're seeing something like that exists in Bolivia as well. Absolutely. Um, as I said, this group in particular, the Cruzanista Youth Union, were the main group behind this violence and violence in 2008 and 2009. All of these sorts of groups in the east of Bolivia that have provoked, that have used to demand secession and today pose as environmentalist groups, they, re they received, Wiki a WikiLeaks leak um, revealed that they received around $4 million of funding in 2008 and 2009. Um, that relationship exists today as well. Absolutely. So let's talk about protesters who are claiming to be environmentalists now. Um, let's talk about the handling of, Evo Morale, of President Evo Morales when it comes to the fires. Um, the opposition claims that Evo himself is to blame for the fires. Is there any basis to that? Um, there's certainly not any basis when you look at how um, the Bolivian government has approached um, both the Amazon region and further south historically. Um, a claim by a lot of right-wing protesters is that Evo Morales signed the law, a presidential decree, allowing the control burning in some areas of the forest. Um, it's certainly true that he signed a decree allowing such burnings, but this decree was originally brought in under the President Hugo Banced, who was the former military dictator, and under that decree you could burn unlimited areas. Um, and that's how he formed an alliance with the big landowning class in Santa Cruz. The decree Evo Morales signed limited the burning to only 20 hectares, which is relatively small areas of land. Now in international media and in right-wing media in Bolivia, that's been presented as the first decree of, of this kind and, and like, um, behind the fires that are raging across the Amazon and further south in the country today. Tell us briefly a bit about the opposition candidates, former President Carlos Mesa and the third place uh, candidate Oscar Ortiz in the current polls. What are their policies and who's supporting them? Well, they have very similar poli politics, but represent very different social bases. Um, Carlos Mesa represents what we call the middle class 
um, of the highlands, areas like La Paz, Cochabamba, whereas Oscar Ortiz, he is from Santa Cruz, he represents uh, the forces supporting him were the same forces behind the secession and autonomy movements in 2008 and 2009. Those bases, although very similar class bases, um, are, in, are sometimes in contradiction with each other. The, the base behind Carlos Mesa was very, much, was very much against the secessionist and autonomous movements in Santa Cruz. Um, they don't have the same racial and racist politics that some of those in Santa Cruz hold. Um, but they both represent um, a section of the middle class that hasn't been able to cohere politically. And this is why the opposition hasn't been able to present a united front against Evo Morales in this, camp in this election, nor in any of the other previous elections. So what sort of record is Evo running on? What's been the overall legacy over the past 13 years? And do you think there's any truth to this vast opposition the mainstream media is beginning to report on now? Well, the, the legacy has been one of transformation over 13 years. Before Morales came in, the, during the Bolivia's neoliberal period, um, Bolivia was the poorest country in Latin America. It was facing something of a humanitarian crisis. Over two-thirds of the country lived below the poverty line. Around a third lived below in extreme poverty. Um, those figures have now halved. Um, before Morales came in, around half the state budget was formed by international foreign aid and international loans from institutions like the IMF and the World Bank. That today has disappeared thanks to the nationalization of um, natural resources and strategic industries which has provided the government with revenue with which to invest in things like infrastructure, public services, in agriculture as well. One last question Ali, what's your prediction for the October 20th election? Will he win in the first round? And how much support does he actually have on the ground? I think Morales will win in the first round, narrowly, and that's because all polls currently have him at around 40% or just under 40%, and they have Carlos Mesa at around 25%. Those numbers have stayed relatively static over the past few months. Under Bolivian law, you need 50% for a first round victory, but you can win with 40% if you are 10 points ahead of the second place. All polls show that Morales is on course for that. And I think the, on the ground, Morales supporters have been galvanized in the past year by initiatives such as the launching of free healthcare in the beginning of 2019. And on the other side, on the opposition, the, the mass protest movements that they had in 2017 and 2018 have mostly dissipated. They've lost their ability for mass mobilization. Because out of this, the, there's been the fragmentation that has meant that there have been an array of candidates that failed to unite against Morales. So the, initi the initiative on the streets is certainly behind Morales, but the initiative on the, on the plane of communications is certainly much more tricky. Um, the opposition have very sophisticated strategies on social media, something the government has not been able to match. And so the election will be fought on much a, as an information battle as much as anything else, I think. Thanks so much for the chat, Ollie. We've been speaking to in-house Bolivian journalist, Ollie Vargas.